In this video, I'll be going over some typical calculations as it relates to investing in stocks. So here we're going to be working with quarterly dividends. Jamie and Peter Dawson own 220 shares of Duke Energy Common Stock. Duke Energy's quarterly dividend is 86 cents per share. What is the amount of the dividend check the Dawson couple will receive for this quarter? So here's our formula to determine the quarterly dividend check amount. We're going to be taking the quarterly dividend per share and multiply it by how many shares we have. So we'll take the 86 cents, multiply it by the 220, and we get $189.20 for our quarterly dividend. Next, we're going to calculate the return on an investment. Wanda Sotheby purchased 120 shares of Home Depot stock at $128 a share. A year later, she sold the stock for $140 a share. She paid her broker a $34 commission when she purchased the stock and a $39 commission when she sold it. During the 12 months she owned the stock, she received $427 in dividends. Calculate Wanda's total return on this investment. So there's several formulas we'll be using. First, we need to figure out her total cost of purchase. So here's our formula. We're going to take the price per share in which she bought the stock at, multiply it by how many shares she has, and add in the commission. So we'll take the 128 times 120 shares and add the $34. So this will be the total cost of her buying stock. And we get $15,394. Next, we have to calculate the total sale proceeds that occur a year later. In this formula, you'll take the price per share a year later, multiply it by the 120 shares, because she's selling all of it, and we will subtract the commission. So here we'll take the 140, multiply by the 120, and then take that amount and subtract the $39 commission. So we get 16761 Now as a note, you might ask, well, why did we add the commission here but subtract the commission there? In the first formula, this is the total cost Wanda incurs. So there's the cost of the shares and the cost of the commission. So we add that all together. In the second formula with the sale proceeds, this is the money she gets back from selling her shares. So this is the amount that she gets from her shares at the $140 price. But before she can get that back, she has to pay the $39 commission. Hence, it gets subtracted from this amount here. In the last formula, we're going to find the total return. So we'll take the dividends that she received, that's the 427, and we'll add the capital gain or loss. So here's my dividend of 427. And then to determine if we have a capital gain or loss, we'll take the total sale proceeds minus the cost of purchase, and that'll give us 1,367 here on the right. Then when we add that to our dividends, we will get $1,794. Note, you'll get a capital loss if it turns out that our sale proceeds is less than the cost of purchase, meaning we're losing money. In this next problem, we're going to be calculating post-split shares. In September, the board of directors of Chaparral Steel approved a two-for-one stock split. After the split, how many shares of Chaparral Steel stock will an investor have if he or she owned 230 shares before the split? So here's our formula. So we'll plug in how many shares we have before the split, that's the 230, and we're going to multiply that by our split ratio. So we have 2 over 1, and that comes from the 2 for 1 stock split. So when we take 230 times 2 over 1, we get 460 shares after the split. In other words, we've doubled our shares. Let's go ahead and calculate earnings per share and price earnings ratio. Michelle Townsend owns stock in National Computers. Based on information in its annual report, National Computers reported after-tax earnings of $9,700,000 and has issued 7 million shares of common stock. The stock is currently selling for $32 a share. So in our first formula here for our earnings per share, we're going to take our earnings and divide it by our shares. So we'll take the 9.7 million and divide it by the 7 million. That'll give us $1.39. Now, you'll likely end up with a longer decimal, but since we're talking about money, we round to the two decimal places. We'll go ahead and calculate the price earnings ratio. So we'll take the price per share in our story, the $32, and divide it by the earnings per share we just determined above. So taking the $32, dividing it by $1.39, we get a PE ratio of 23. Let's continue looking at analyzing earnings per share. 
Analysts that follow J.P. Morgan Chase, one of the nation's largest providers of financial services, estimate that the corporation's earnings per share will increase from $6.69 in the current year to $7.64 next year. So here's our formula. We're really just comparing next year's earnings to this year's earnings. So we'll take the $7.64 from next year and subtract the $6.69 from the current year, and that means we're expecting a $0.95 cents increase in our earnings per share. Let's go ahead and look at dividend yields. Currently, Boeing pays an annual dividend of $5.68. If the stock is selling for $180, what is the dividend yield? Here's our formula to determine the dividend yield. We're gonna take the annual dividend amount and divide it by the current price per share. So taking the $5.68 and dividing it by our 180, we get a dividend yield of 0.0316 or 3.16%. Recall that to convert our decimals into percentages, we just have to move the decimal over two places. Let's look at the book value per share. Casper Energy Exploration reports that the corporation's assets are valued at $185 million. Its liabilities are $80 million, and it has issued 6 million shares of stock. What's the book value for a share of Casper stock? So here we have our formula for the book value per share. We're going to be taking the assets minus our liabilities, and then we'll divide it by our shares. So our assets was 185 million minus our liabilities of 80 million and dividing that number by our 6 million shares. So solving our numerator down, we get 105 million. Then we'll divide by the 6 million and that gives us $17.50. Next is calculating the average cost per share. For four years, Marty Campbell invested $4,000 each year in Harley Davidson. The stock was selling for $74 in 2014, $62 in 2015, $51 in 2016, and $59 in 2017. So in the first part, we want to know what was Marty's total investment. So we'll take our annual investment of $4,000, and it says that Marty invested for four years. So we're going to multiply by four years. When we multiply these two numbers, our total investment is $16,000. Next, we have to figure out, well, how many shares does Marty own? So we've got our data here. We've got the four years. We know Marty invested $4,000 a year. And here's the purchase price that was identified for each year above. To figure out how many shares were actually purchased with that investment, we will simply divide. So we'll take the 4,000 divided by 74, and we get 54.1 shares. We'll do the same for 2015. We'll do the same for 2016. And then last but not least, we'll divide these two numbers again to get the number of shares purchased in 2017. Next, we're going to add up all the shares because these are the shares purchased each year. So for our total shares, we get 264.8. Now to determine our average cost per share, we'll take our total investment that we calculated above and divide it by our total shares. So taking the 16,000 divided by 264.8, we get the average cost per share being approximately $60.42. This is a more accurate way to get the average cost per share versus simply just taking the average of our four numbers right here. This is too simplistic. By doing this, we are taking into account how many shares were actually purchased in terms of our amount of investment, and so we get a more precise average cost per share. All right, let's look at some more shares and profit calculations. Bob Orleans invested $3,000 and borrowed $3,000 to purchase shares in Verizon Communications. At the time of his investment, Verizon was selling for $47 a share. So we're gonna be looking at a couple of different scenarios. If Bob paid $30 on commission, how many shares could he buy if he used only his own money and did not use margin? So it's important that we understand what margin is and what that means. And so here's our formula. We're going to find the number of shares purchased by taking the funds available for investment and dividing it by the price per share. Now again, because in this scenario, part A, he does not use margin, that means we're not going to use the borrowed amount of 3000 So really, our funds available is his original investment of $3,000 minus the commission, and then we'll divide it by the price per share of $47. That gives us 2907 divided by 47, or 63.2 shares. In part B, we still have the same background info, but it's a slightly different scenario. If Bob paid a $60 commission, how many shares could he buy if he used his $3,000 of personal money and borrowed the $3,000 on margin to buy Verizon stock? So in other words, we're going to be totaling up our funds available, Bob's money as well as the money on margin. So we'll take the 3,000 plus 3,000, 
minus the $60 commission, and then divide all of that by our price per share. So when I simplify my parentheses, I get $5,940. And then when I divide it by my price per share of 47, we get 126.4 shares. In part C, assume Bob did use margin and paid a $60 total commission to buy his Verizon stock. Also assume he paid another $60 to sell his stock and sold the stock for $54 a share. How much profit did he make on his Verizon stock investment? In other words, this is a continuation of part B. So we can use the information we got in part B for this problem. So we need to figure out our net sale proceeds, and here's our formula. We'll take our sales price and multiply it by our shares, and then subtract the sales commission. So we're going to take the $54 uh, that he sold it for, times the 126.4 shares we found in part B. Then we'll minus the $60 sales commission for selling off his stock. Plugging all of this into my calculator, we get a net sale proceeds of $6,765.60. Now a comment, uh, when looking at this, you might say, well, he paid $60 to buy the stock and $60 to sell the stock. So wouldn't that mean we subtract sales commissions of $120? No, because when in part B, you calculated the 126.4 shares here, you already accounted for the $60 commission for buying the stock. So if you put 120 here, that means you're double counting uh, the commission to purchase the stock. So be aware, that's why we only subtract the $60 from the net sale proceeds process. Next, we're going to calculate the profit. So we'll take the net sale proceeds we just identified above, and we'll subtract our total investment. So taking our $6,765.60, we'll subtract $6,000. Again, the $6,000 is the amount he has and the amount he borrowed to purchase. Subtracting the two, we get $765.60. So if you have any questions, just let me know.